Hello and welcome to Enlightened Empaths, your community for the spiritually awakened, where we discuss, explore, and connect with fellow empaths, healers, intuitives, and seekers. Hello and welcome to Enlightened Empaths. How are you doing, Denise? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm good. We have a great show today. We're going to be talking about what type of style attachment do you have in your relationship? But before we dive into that, I just wanted to uh, share some feedback with everyone. I had posted on my Instagram some photos of me going to Colorado to film an episode with Beyond Belief for Gaia TV. And it was so funny to these because on psychic teachers, and I think sometimes on here, I talk a lot about my dear friend, Joel, who's our crystal expert friend in Colorado. Yes. So because I, uh, because of COVID, I haven't been able to see him in like two years. So he lives just 30 minutes away from where my hotel was. So I got to see him and I posted pictures of like Gaia and, and me in the makeup room. And then I posted a picture of me and Joel. That was the one everyone wanted to know about. That's Joel. <laughs> <laughs> so just wanted to thank everybody for your fun comments and questions. And yes, that is the Joel, the crystal expert. And we just had a great time getting to see each other in person and, and catch up and I got to go to a crystal store and I finally found a crystal I wanted for years. I'm holding it right now. It's a manifestation crystal. And that's when a tiny crystal grows inside a bigger crystal. But the tiny crystal inside the bigger crystal is fully formed. And then the, the clear quartz grows around it. And it's said to help you manifest specific goals and dreams. Wow. That, that sounds really like good. it was an amazing trip. And and being on TV was incredible. I don't know about incredible. It was a little nerve wracking, but the team at Gaia was so kind. I don't know what it is about Colorado. I think I need to move there. I have never met such kind people in my life. I would just be walking down the street and people would go, I love your coat. Hope you have a groovy day. Your hair looks lovely today. Like I've never, everyone talks to everyone. It's not like that here. Well, it's, it's definitely not like that here. <laughs> yes, it is a very friendly part of the country. I agree. It was so friendly, so kind. And I get to, I had a driver, so I felt very fancy. You know, that was really cool. Ooh. And they dropped me off at the studios and one of the producers was waiting for me at the de- at the door and she gave me a huge hug. Nice to meet you in person. And, and everyone was so incredibly kind. And, and I got to meet George Nori in person, which- Ooh. That's fun. So fun. And I just I just have to tell a quick little aside about manifesting and not giving up on your dreams. I've been listening to Coast to Coast forever when it was Art Bell and then when George Norrie joined. I've been a Coast to Coast insider even longer. And whenever George Norrie has anyone on talking about psychic stuff or studying intuition or looking at intuitive dreams, he always mentions his aunt's book, Breakthrough to Creativity. And he always asks the guest, have you read my aunt's book? And every time the guest is like, no, I've never heard of that. So I was at, uh, I think it was the used library book sale one year, years ago, like five, six years ago. And I saw it and I was like, I am buying this freaking book and I'm reading it and (laughs) I'm keeping it on my bookshelf as a reminder that one day I'm going to meet George Norrie. And when he asked me that question, have you read my aunt's book, Breakthrough to Creativity? I can say, why, yes, George, I have. And I can quote it back to you. So it was just great that I was able to to manifest that. That's incredible. And it's fun. So was he excited that you knew the book? He was. Yeah. And we were able to talk and share some stories about it. So that was just really and truly a dream come true. Now, the trip home, another little lesson that I learned So I had to fly from Denver to Dallas and then from Dallas to home. And we get to the flight to Dallas is fine. Great. Oh, P.S. I also loved being in the Denver airport. I got to see the spooky murals and Lucifer, the creepy (laughs) Mustang. I loved that. But anyway, we get to Dallas and we get on the plane and uh, we just are sitting there and no one knows what's going on. We're not moving. It's been about an hour. The pilot comes on and he's like, there's a security issue in the in the airspace over North and South Carolina. I don't know what's going on. 
So the the flight attendant stands up and she's like, okay, everybody, it looks like we're going to be here a little bit longer. So let's play a game of trivia. And for every right answer, you get a free bag of pretzels or peanuts. And so everyone cheers, but then her mic kept going out. So those of us, us peasants in the back, we couldn't hear her. Uh So first class kept winning. (laughs) And these guys in the back are like, first class doesn't need any more shit. (laughs) (laughs) So we were all cracking up. And then finally the pilot comes on. It's been about an hour and a half now. And he says, okay, everybody, I've been cleared to tell you what you already know. The China spy balloon is flying over the the airspace that we are trying to land in. And we all cheered and started screaming, you know, China, China. And it was just so funny because every, we were there almost three hours. And it was at the point where he was like, I have to turn off the engines or we may have to deboard and spend the night here. Like we just didn't know. And everybody on the plane had the most amazing attitude. People were laughing and joking. They were coming up with different ways they could shoot the the spy balloon down themselves. And it was just a blast. And it was just such a lesson to me of how, you know, your attitude is everything. You know, if one person on that plane had been like, son of a bitch, what the hell is this? It would have ruined everything. But because the whole group was so fun and and warm and like yeah let's you know throw some pretzels back here we're fine and and everyone talked and got to know each other so even even that was a joy oh of course then we land at our airport and the pilot comes on and he's like okay everybody thank you for your patience first of all i have to say i live here too in this town i want to go home just as badly as you we need someone i can't remember the word he used like to rope us in or tie us in Mm -hmm. and he said I've radioed the airport three times. No one's answering. And people start shouting, China's taken over our little airport. <laughs> so it was crazy. It took a, it took me so long to get home, but but I did and I had a fantastic time. Oh. And and George Norrie is a nice person. Very, very nice person. Yes. Yes. Oh. Beautiful, beautiful soul. Wonderful to meet him. And I I loved his team even more. Like he's just surrounded by great people. Absolutely great people. I just felt really at home. The the woman who did my makeup, she had just met this man online and he has, he's semi-retired, but he has a lot of money. And his new goal is to buy up crystal mines. So he's, he's already bought two and he's only buying these crystal mines to make sure that the crystals are mined and sourced ethically. Oh, I mean, those are my people. Yes. So and I just really enjoyed it. I I am so, so glad that you had such a good time. And I'm looking forward to seeing the episode too. Yeah, it's not going to air till this summer, but that's okay. Well, that gives us time to get ready for it. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's jump into the topic. Thank you for letting me share those little stories. Oh, no, thank you. That was fun. So as you know, empaths and relationships, you know, sometimes it can be a little tricky because we feel everything so deeply. And so we thought it would be interesting just to kind of look at some different type of relationship styles we might be dealing with. I'm sure we've all heard of your love language. You know, what love language are you? But have you heard of the five attachment styles? This theory is based on the belief that each of us has a style, a manner, in which we attach ourselves to a romantic interest. This doesn't mean attachment as in needy or clingy, necessarily. Attachment in this way is defined as the way you bond with a romantic partner. So attachment basically means the way you connect, relate, and feel safe with someone. Now, this attachment theory was developed by psychologists John Bowlby and Mary Ainsworth more than 50 years ago, and their findings still hold up today. So here's their theory in a nutshell. How your parents or caregivers loved you in your first five years of your life plays a critical role in your emotional development and continues to affect the way you relate to others on a personal level. That's heavy. What do you think about that? Well, it goes with the development. You know, so much of our development is based on the first three years of life. 
um, emotional, social development, all those things. So that makes sense to me. Yeah, it's it concerning. Does it's very concerning, but it's, it's a big stuff. Mary Ainsworth said that um, she introduced the sensitivity hypothesis, which basically says the more responsive your mom was to you as an infant, the more secure you'll be in your future relationships. And it was interesting. She did these studies where she would put the mom and the child in a room and she'd have the mom leave. And then Mary would look at how the child reacted to the mother leaving. And then she'd have a stranger come into the room and she would study the way the child interacted with the stranger. And then she'd have the mom go back into the room and she would study the way the child responded to the mom coming back. So we'll touch base on that a little bit later. But back, back to us. If you've noticed a pattern or trend in your relationships throughout your life, then listen up because you might be able to recognize your personal attachment style. And you can go to our Facebook page, Enlightened Empaths, this week because we're going to be posting some quizzes you can take to determine for sure what your attachment style is. So basically, Bowlby and Ainsworth divided attachment styles into two groups, secure and insecure. And of course, there's some subgroups in there. Let's start by reviewing the healthiest attachment style, which is the secure one. Someone who has a secure attachment style was well-loved and cared for as a child. They were given some freedom and independence for decision-making and were able to feel secure in making key choices in their life. Their childhood most likely consisted of secure, consistent attention and caregiving. Now, if you have this attachment style, you most likely saw your mother or primary caregiver as a safe person, your home. When she left, you were mildly upset, but easily soothed. In relationships as adults, these people with the secure attachment style connect with others easily while also being able to maintain autonomy. For example, they aren't looking for someone to complete them. They know who they are and what they want, and they simply enjoy being around others for connection. The secure attachment style person loves to be in a relationship, but they also know they'll be just fine if they're single. This person also tends to have healthier, longer lasting relationships, which makes sense, right? It really does. Yes. All right. Ready to move on to the insecure attachment styles? <laughs> yes. Because I'm, I'm thinking whenever we do these kind of shows, I start trying to match up the style with people that I know in my life. Mm -hmm. And anyone who's coming from a secure place in relationships and has that background to build on. That is pretty amazing when you think about it. It I'm, is I'm, amazing. I'm having a, a limited number of people pop into my head on that one. <laughs> well, we'll we'll get back to that, I promise, at the end about yeah. how many have that secure attachment style percentage wise. Okay. Okay. The second type of attachment style is called anxious preoccupied. So if you grew up with inconsistent parents who weren't always very reliable you might have this ancient attachment style. As a child, you may have discovered that sometimes your parents or caregivers were there for you and other times they weren't, and there was really no rhyme or reason to it. If this resonates with you, possibly you tended to cling to your mother for love and acceptance or experience separation anxiety when your mom or primary caregiver left you. Studies show that the anxiously attached person tends to feel stressed when their mom leaves, and while they're relieved when she returns, they often then choose to punish the mother by ignoring her or lashing out in anger. You know, I babysat for a kid like that, and I never understood it. He would kick and scream and freak out every time the mom left. But when the mom came back, you know, like she'd pay me, how do you do, and thank me. And, and the kid would run up to her and then would like kick her in the shins or completely ignore her. Hmm. I always thought it was so strange, but... I guess he has this anxious attachment style. Right. Also, people with this anxious attachment style were often smothered by one parent who was overly clingy or anxious themselves. So let's say you were raised by a helicopter or snowplow parent, you know, those parents who just hover or do everything for you mm -hmm. might have this attachment style. Or if your parents divorced and let's say you were the oldest and maybe you had to often play the role of co-parent. This can sometimes lead to the anxious, preoccupied attachment style. Now, as an adult in a relationship, you might feel filled with doubt a lot of the time. 
anxious about the relationship, or you may be unreasonably jealous or battling fears that your partner is going to leave you. The anxious, preoccupied person might demand to know every detail of their partner's life or insist they do everything together. You might blast your love interest with multiple texts each day, constantly wanting to know what they're doing, what they're thinking. The anxious, preoccupied person tends to overanalyze everything their partner does and says. Also, as adults, they tend to rely heavily on their parents for help, approval, advice, and support. In their intimate relationships, they are typically clingy, anxious, and jealous. The anxiously attached person also tends to criticize themselves while putting others on a pedestal. If you have this attachment style, you might perceive your partner as better than you are, better looking, smarter, more successful. And throughout your life, you might find yourself seeking the approval of others and overly relying on your partner and friends for advice, help, support, and decision-making. Your number one goal in a relationship is safety. You are looking for a safe partner, I guess, to calm that wave of anxiety going on with inside them. Right. What a difference between the two. I know, right? And how it manifests throughout life and in relationships. I know. Do you want to tell us about the next one, the dismissive type? Sure. Uh, the next attachment style is the dismissive avoidance style. If growing up, your needs as a child were often dismissed or ignored, you might relate to this attachment style. In childhood, your parents may have been aloof, disengaged, or emotionally absent. Many with this attachment style survive childhood by pushing down their personal needs and wants. In studies, children with this attachment style were not bothered at all when their mom or primary caregiver left them. They showed almost no stranger anxiety and expressed little relief or joy when the mother returns. As an adult, you probably see yourself as a strongly independent person who doesn't need anyone's help. You're the lone wolf among your peers. You don't rely on anyone for anything. You might reject your own need for intimacy, focusing instead on giving to everyone else and never stating your own needs. Often this person is afraid of commitment and will often move from one relationship to the next. They tend to avoid overt acts of intimacy, like too much hand-holding and hugging. You might feel very pleased with yourself for not needing others. They often put down people who need or want to be in relationships. They definitely aren't the romantic or touchy-feely type. They can discuss their needs from an intellectual level but have a hard time sharing their heart. Many with this attachment style describe themselves as having high self-esteem. So while the anxiously attached person tends to view themselves in a poor light while seeing everyone else around them as better, the dismissively attached person is the opposite. They enjoy themselves in their own company while seeing everyone else as annoying and needy. Isn't that interesting? So the anxious one criticizes themselves and puts everyone else on a pedestal and the dismissive one puts themselves on a pedestal and dismisses others. Right. I wonder if there's any flux between the two. Like if there's a continuum between the two. There is. And um, I'll, I'll talk about that again towards the end, because okay. what they've done is they've taken the study that was done, you know, more than 50 years ago. And many psychologists have like recreated the study and, and tested it and added to it. And so there is a lot of uh, flex here. And what they've determined is that often your style can change depending on who you're with. I have been thinking while we've been reading these and sharing these is that the term mother is almost outdated, but 50 years ago, we didn't have the freedom to have so many different family types. So it would almost be that in this day and age, it would be whoever the primary caregiver is for that child, not necessarily a, a, a mother or, or a biological mother person. That's really important to point out. And it's, it's a good thing to point out because don't you think the mom's always blamed? <laughs> I I think it depends on social, cultural, and uh, familial <laughs> expectations. But yes, there is a lot of blame in that, or mothers who will blame themselves. So. Well, and I want to point out when I was seeing a therapist to help me with my issues with my mom, because you know, longtime listeners know we don't have the best relationship, and she's a very difficult person, and. 
my therapist said to me, like you and your sisters are so healthy and doing so great. And, you know, that's wonderful. And I said, yeah, I know. We always wonder that, like, you know, we, we married good people. We're good parents ourselves. Like, you know, what, why is that? And he said, oh, I know why he said, cause you guys had a great dad. Oh, and he said, you know, studies have shown if you have one consistent caregiver, you're going to be fine. And it doesn't have to be, like you said, it doesn't have to be a biological mother or father. Uh, it can just be, if you have one consistent adult in your life who loves you and supports you and shows up for you, it helps tremendously. That's huge. Yeah. That's really huge. Yeah. And I, I just hope any, any divorced or single parents who are dealing with like a dismissive ex or, you know, a, a deadbeat parent who just doesn't come around and you're worried this is going to be visited on your kids. I hope that helps because it was really empowering to hear him say that if you one adult who loves and cares for you in your life, you'll, you'll be fine. That's an excellent message to share with people. Yeah. Okay. Now we come to the fearful avoidant attachment style. These are people who strongly desire a relationship, but can't seem to manifest it because they're terrified of getting hurt. If growing up, you had to deal with physical or emotional abuse or outright neglect, you may have developed this attachment style. People who are fearful and avoidant in their relationships tend to have been raised in families that rejected them on some core level. As a kid, you may have had to learn that your primary caregivers were unreliable and untrustworthy. As an adult, you might love romantic movies and books, enjoy seeing your friends in happy relationships, while strongly craving that for yourself as well, all the while wondering, why not me? Why isn't this happening for me? The fearful avoidant attachment style person has difficulty manifesting this healthy relationship because they feel unworthy of love and acceptance. The fearfully attached person often has many sexual partners throughout their life, but few relationships that are intimately close. The string of sexual relationships is a way for them to feel temporarily close without having to risk investing their hearts. If they are in a relationship, the fearfully attached person tends to keep a part of themselves always secreted away. They also have to battle with this feeling of waiting for the other shoe to drop, always suspecting that something bad will happen. They tend to view both themselves and others in a negative light. The fearfully attached person is similar to the dismissive one in that they keep their emotional distance from others, but they also feel an intense need to be intimately connected in a relationship. So there's this terrible push-pull cycle going on inside. That one just makes me sad. It does. That's a very sad one. They all make sense when you look at the seed that was planted when someone's a little person to how it man manifests throughout life. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I should note that the research I was doing, all of the studies said these will result if you have unhealed trauma and issues from your childhood. So I just want to, again, stress that these are fluid. They aren't set in stone. If you're listening to this and you're like, oh crap, I think that's me. I'm doomed. No. That's not true. New studies have shown you can change your attachment style. I am so, so glad you added that in because I think that people do lock in and say, oh, well, there's nothing I can do about it or look where I came from or look where I am now. There's always change. Always, you, you always have that capability. Yes. All right. Do you want to tell us about the last one? Sure. Uh, the last one we'll discuss is called the disorganized attachment style. This is the newest attachment style and was introduced in 1990 by Drs. Maine and Solomon. Someone with a disorganized attachment style tends to have dramatic ups and downs in their relationships. They swing between feeling needy and clingy to jealous and suspicious. This type of attachment style begins in childhood through trauma. Or if one of your parents had huge upheavals in their life, like having to deal with mental illness, or their own highly dramatic ups and downs, you may have formed this attachment style. In relationships, the disorganized attachment style person believes they're unworthy of love. Filled with low self-esteem, they also tend to seek out drama and chaos without intending to. If you have this attachment style, you have to first work on healing the unresolved childhood trauma, then work on self-love before you can tackle overcoming your fear of abandonment. 
The disorganized attachment style is often attracted to partners who are frankly a little scary. You might be attracted to the strong silent type who then suddenly lashes out in anger. The disorganized attachment person often struggles with intimacy, which is rooted in their fear of getting hurt. But ironically, they tend to be subconsciously attracted to the one person that will hurt them. You know who that reminds me of is Pamela Anderson. Oh, what a good example. Yeah. Did did you see Pam and Tommy on Hulu or her documentary on Netflix? No. Really good viewing, I swear. It was very, very interesting. And she had set this goal for herself. No more bad boys. You know, I'm not going to go for the rebel anymore. And then, you know, she met Tommy Lee that night. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So hopefully she will work on on healing that because I just... I just really have grown to love her for watching her documentary and all that she's been through. But yeah, I think we've all known people who are just attracted to that drama in the relationships. I mean, it's surely growing up in high school and college, didn't you come across people who just kept falling into those dramatic, chaotic relationships? Yes, very much so. And I think that there is, people have a type. And you know, that's basically what all these are saying is, what you were programmed with or what you experienced can be an indicator in what you feel is love. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So as I said, research has shown that often this will change throughout our life and we can swing between one of these four insecure attachment styles, depending on who we're dating. A study done in 1995 by doctors Brennan and Shaver revealed there's a strong connection between your own attachment style and your romantic partner's attachment style. So if you're typically pretty secure in your relationships and then you stumble into dating a person with the dismissive avoidant attachment style, you might find yourself slipping into the anxious preoccupied style where you're constantly wondering when they're going to call you again. Do they really like you? What are their intentions? Is there someone else? In an article published on simplypsychology.com, they said the dismissive avoidant partner was the only type of partner that seemed to contribute negatively towards one's relationship satisfaction, while an anxious partner had no significant impact in this aspect. Now, I just have a hard time believing that. I understand why it would be so hard to date someone with the dismissive avoidant style. That I don't think I could do that. You know, someone who doesn't want to hold your hand or rub your back or, I don't know, just show any care or concern for you. I get that. But dating an anxious person, what are you thinking? Penny for your thoughts. What are you doing today? What are you doing right now? Why'd you post that on Facebook? That would drive me insane. Don't you? (laughs) Yes. And I've spoken with a lot of people who come, they're, they're just, they're worried. They're very worried all the time about the relationship. That's a hard place to be. Yeah, it definitely is. Now, this article that I read also referenced another study on young adults, which showed that participants expressed distinct attachment patterns for different relationship types, meaning that you might have one attachment style with your parents, another attachment style with friends, and a totally different one with your romantic partner. So that's interesting too. You might be dismissive with your parents anxiously attached with your romantic partner or fearfully attached with your friends. Okay. Happily though, studies reveal that around 75% of us have a secure attachment style. That's a lot. I don't know if I'm buying that. You're not buying that? Uh, That seems really high. I (laughs) I don't know. Maybe. (laughs) Don't you think that's a little high? Three quarters of the population. We're all good. I I don't know. I know. I thought that was pretty high too, but it made me happy. Like me. Oh, it is. It's a happy Let's just thing, but pretend it's true. Okay. <laughs> Statistics never lie, Denise. Oh, no, no. There's no bias. And 30% of the research participants have been able to change their attachment style with the help of inner reflection, healing, and therapy. And interestingly, so you know how the studies show that the easiest insecure person to be in a relationship one is the anxiously attached person. They are also the easiest ones to heal. You know, I think that number should be higher. I think it should be more than 30% could shift things. 
with well let's just pretend we did this study and flip it let's say 30 okay. percent have a secure <laughs> attachment style and 75 percent have been able to change their attachment style done okay by doctors Faye and Corral. <laughs> i like our study better i do too but i do think that um you do move through these different attachment styles throughout your life. And I do think that, that with either, whether it's talking therapy with a actual therapist or writing therapy, like you've talked about so beautifully on the show before, or if it's just through really serious time spent alone, reflecting within, looking at the patterns in your relationship, looking at what went right, what went wrong, who you tend to be attracted to and why, you know, what about that person besides their good looks or whatever it was that initially attracted you, what kept you attracted and what pattern can you see there? And then looking at you, like what have you brought to relationships, right? What do you add? What do you contribute? And seeing how that has changed and grown throughout your life. I think that can all be very, very helpful. I agree. I agree, especially for people who may have had that epiphany of, oh my gosh, I've been dating the same person with a different face. Or my relationships always end with this, this is the outcome. Or I make it a certain length of time in a relationship before it crashes and burns. Those could all be indicators to, to really look at these styles and say, is there something I can switch within myself? Because it always comes back to, we can always change ourselves. We may not be able to impact the surroundings or the other people, but we always have that gift to, to change within. Yeah, I agree. And I think too, have you ever noticed, I had a friend in college, now granted we were in college and we were young and silly and all of that, but whoever she dated she was like a chameleon and she would kind of change. So if she dated someone who was like super fun and outgoing and partied, she would party. If she dated someone, she dated this one guy who like played the guitar and wrote poetry. And, and then she started doing that. You know, those types of people who Mm -hmm. don't change for their relationships. I think that's someone who needs to slow down and do some inner reflection about, you know, who am I? What do I want in a relationship rather than being this empty vessel waiting for someone to fill you up? I think so what style do you feel like that would be? I think that would probably be the fearful one. Right. Right. Because they're, so they're the trying, anxious, preoccupied or anxious, preoccupied. Yeah. Um, Just trying so hard to, you know, get someone to like you and, and align with, with who they are. Right. It's all very interesting. It is. It really is. And like I said, there's a bunch of free quizzes online. So we'll post some on our Facebook page so you can click there and take the quiz. Most of them take one to four minutes. And you can see what attachment style you have. And also maybe it would help with relationships that you're in right now to navigate. If someone is coming from that place, it might give you more empathy and compassion for understanding how to build a stronger and healthier relationship with that person. Yes. You know, my, my sister was telling me, she just read a book called, I think it's called the power of a moment. Mm -hmm. And the author was talking about how you can have an intimate conversation with a stranger on an airplane or a train or a bus for almost an hour and be more intimately connected with them than your partner you've been with for over 20 years. Because there's no, they'll be gone. They're a flash in the pan. There'll be someone. And when you were saying that years and years ago, I was taking a flight from the West Coast to the East Coast, young, very young. And I had this very detailed conversation with this person, different lifestyle, different. We were roughly the same age, but I think there's a freedom in knowing you're never going to see that person again. And even if you exchange information, but there's a a freedom in the anonymity. Oh, I totally agree. But he was also saying that once people get in a committed relationship, they get very settled. Mm -hmm. And he was saying that there's, there's no intimacy in sitting on a couch and watching TV with someone. 
There's no intimacy in sitting at a dinner table and talking about your cranky boss at work that day. And so I think if I heard my sister correctly, she was saying when two strangers meet in what you just described, you know, the situation that's very safe and, and anonymous, they actually create more intimacy and authentic moment connection than couples who've been together for years do. And so he talks a lot in the book about how we have to constantly be working towards cultivating that intimacy and having those moments, those, those powerful moments together. And so anyway, I just say all that to add to what you just said that, yeah, this, if you are in a committed relationship, it'd be fun to take that quiz and have your partner take the quiz and then discuss it and have Mm -hmm. a powerful moment. (laughs) (laughs) Well, we hope this has been enlightening for you all. Thank you so much for tuning in and listening. Remember, if you want to check out our work, you can go to Denise's website, The Grateful Messenger, or mine is just my name, samanthafay.com. If you want to send a question for our upcoming community connections, you can email us, enlightenedempaths at gmail.com. And if you'd enjoyed this episode, we'd really appreciate it if you'd share it with a friend or leave us a kind review on your listening platform. And please remember, as always, to show up, do great work, and share your light. Take care.